Hi, I'm Robert Jeffers, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas. We are so excited to have you join us on the I campus today for a time of inspiring worship and biblical teaching. You are part of a vast online community gathered from all over the world. We consider you a part of our First Baptist Church family, and we hope you feel a part of what God is doing in and through First Baptist Dallas. No matter where you are, we hope and pray that this is a time you will grow in your relationship with God and others as we worship our Savior together. Welcome to worship. Many people suffer unending regrets because they've chosen to say no to God's most basic commands. That's why I wrote my new book, The Ten, How to Live and Love in a World That's Lost Its Way. And in my new book, The Ten, I share what the Ten Commandments mean and how they apply to our lives, and most importantly, why they are God's proven method for freeing us to experience blessings we could never imagine. Discover God's time-tested blueprint for a joyful and flourishing life. The new book is called The Ten. Pick up a copy today wherever books are sold.
unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah. We praise the Lord today. He's great and greatly to be praised. Rebecca St. James is with us. She's going to lead us on this song. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven. And spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ. My living hope Who could imagine So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my
Jesus Christ, our living hope. Wonderful worship, church. You may be seated. And we do welcome each and every one of you to worship this morning here at First Baptist Dallas. And if you're a guest joining us, we're so glad to see you with us this morning. And we do have a very special gift just for you. It's our pastor's brand new book, What Every Christian Should Know. Ten Core Beliefs for Standing Strong in a Shifting World. Guests, as you came in this morning, you received a worship guide. You're going to find enclosed this welcome card. Please take the time to fill this out. You can also scan the QR code. And at the conclusion of the service, take your completed card with you. Right outside these main worship center doors, you're going to find our welcome center. Our staff is waiting there for you. You'll exchange your completed card for your gift today. And we'll be happy to answer any questions you have about our church. We look forward to meeting you. Now, guests, if you can't make it to the Welcome Center, we also have some boxes on your way out. You can place your completed card in one of those boxes, and we'll mail you a copy of your gift. For those guests joining us on iCampus, just follow that link provided on the bottom of your screen. You can access your welcome gift that way. Well, again, welcome to each of you joining us this morning for worship. So many exciting events taking place here at First Baptist Dallas. Let's take a moment now and look together at the screen. Good morning and welcome to worship. Here are a few upcoming events. Tune in to our pastor, Dr. Robert Jeffress' new series on TVN called 18 Minutes with Jesus, filmed in Israel. This series will take a deeper look into Jesus' most well-known teachings. It debuts this Saturday, September 23rd at 6.30 p.m. On October 8th, Dr. Jeffress will begin a brand new sermon series, Holy Living in an Unholy World, a verse-by-verse -verse study of Ephesians. We will study Paul's letter to the Church of Ephesus and discover the connection between sound theology and everyday life. Parents, do you have children who have recently graduated high school or college? Our stewardship ministry is hosting a learning table event called Graduation and Adulthood. Now what? Join us next Sunday, September 24th, as we discuss important financial tips for students and parents. Church family, October 1st is Invite a Guest Sunday. Invite one person to church who needs to hear the truth of the gospel from renowned Christian apologist Lee Strobel and worship with the Newsboys and Benjamin William Hastings. Then stay after service for a Q&A luncheon with Strobel and Dr. Jeffress. We'll see you and your guest on October 1st. For more information on everything happening at our church, visit firstdallas.org slash events. Well, let's take our Bibles now and read God's Word together in preparation for our pastor's message this morning. Say goodbye to career regrets. We're reading from Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. These are words of exhortation for the church today from the Apostle Paul. We'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. The words will be here on the screen as well as on the screens of those viewing via iCampus. Well, church, could we stand together to honor the reading of God's word? Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 through 24. Let's read together. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. May God richly bless the reading of his word. Let's remain standing together as we continue in worship. Rebecca St. James comes to lead us. Sing with us. How deep the Father's love for us. 
How vast beyond a measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that this song is the center of our faith, preaches the gospel to ourselves every time we sing it. It's the truth, it's the heart of Jesus. His love for us is so huge. His mercy is new every morning. It's so good. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I Boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. I should. Jesus paid it all. You may be seated, and let's turn our attention this morning to the screen. Our world is hungry for the truth. Let's respond with messages of hope. Seize the opportunity to be bold ambassadors for Christ this fall at First Dallas. Pray for the hearts of others to be softened and open to God's gift of salvation. Ask God to give you the name of one life you can reach. Radiate God's love through authentic relationships, heartfelt conversations, and hospitality. Church, we are asking you to invite someone to hear former investigative journalist and atheist turned Christian, Lee Strobel, as he presents The Case for Christianity on Sunday, October 1st. Your guest will hear the gospel and be inspired by Strobel's dedication to uncovering the truth. Worship alongside the world-renowned band, The Newsboys, and Benjamin William Hastings, known for his hit song, So Will I. Following the services, you and your guests are invited to attend a thought-provoking question and answer session with Lee Strobel and Dr. Jeffress. As you consider who to invite, think about those you know and those you meet as you go. Those you know, your neighbors, family members, coworkers, and friends, Invite that person God has placed on your heart to church. Extend an invitation through a simple text message, email, or invite card. And those individuals you meet as you go, whether they're your waiter, a cashier, or anyone else you encounter in your daily life, take advantage of the invite cards and resources available across our campus to invite those you meet along the way. 
Imagine what it would look like if we all invited one life. The impact of this chain reaction for the kingdom would be immeasurable. Inspire those around you by extending an invitation and sharing the truth that has transformed your life. Now is the time, church. This is the perfect opportunity to invite the lost, the skeptic, or anyone else with questions about their faith. First Baptist Dallas, transforming the world with God's Word. One life at a time. Well, good morning, church. This morning, we've been singing about the great things that Christ has done for us, that Jesus conquered the grave, that he broke the chains of sin, that he set us free, and that we have victory in Jesus. And that is the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And church, I want to ask you this morning, do you believe that? Do you really believe that? And if you do, how can we do anything but tell others about that? That's the truth that we're going to be discussing two weeks from today on October 1st, Invite a Guest Sunday. I hope that you've been praying about somebody that you can invite to be here on that day. I promise you that if you do, God will bring that person into your life. So pray for them. Engage with them. Invite them to be here on Invite a Guest Sunday. That's what One Life is all about. In your worship guide, you've got our One Life card. And hopefully by now you've identified that person, you've written their name down, and hopefully you've already started building relationship with them. Perhaps you've already invited them. But you've got two weeks to do it. So I'm praying for you. And I'll be praying for you as you invite those people to be here two weeks from today. I'm confident that God is going to work through you. We continue our time of worship through giving, our tithes and offerings this morning. And you can leave those in the boxes as you exit. You can also give those online. Right now, I'll invite you as you're able to kneel all over the worship center as we go to the Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father. We come to you now, we come to you in the powerful and the saving name of Jesus Christ, your son, our savior. And we worship you, Lord, we praise you this morning. We profess our love for you. We acknowledge our full dependence on you, Lord. You are our rock and our redeemer. You are our strength and our shield. You are an ever-present help. You are our salvation. And so, Lord, we give ourselves to you. We give to you our lives. We give to you our service. We give to you our tithes and our offerings, Lord. We give to you our relationships, our work, our worship. We give to you our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength, Lord. We just want to live for you. And so as we abide in you this morning, Lord, we pray that you would abide in us and by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, that we would live a life of righteousness unto you, that we would be faithful servants to you, Lord, and that we would bring honor and glory to your name throughout the world. And we pray this in the saving name of Jesus Christ, the one who set us free. Amen.
Thank you so much, Deanna Brinson and First Dallas Choir and Orchestra for your music today. May I let you in on a poorly kept secret? Most people hate their jobs. Well, now, to be more accurate, I should say most people are dissatisfied with their jobs. And that's not just my opinion. A major university did a survey of 250,000 workers from every walk of life and found that 80% of workers said they were dissatisfied with their jobs, which is especially tragic when you consider the fact that we spend 60% of our waking hours at our job. No wonder work is a fertile field for regrets that people have. And no series on saying goodbye to regrets would be complete without talking about regrets about our work. And that's what we're going to do today. Now, some people may wonder, well, is this even a biblical topic? I mean, unless we're a missionary, evangelist, or pastor, does God really even care about our work? It's amazing how many Christians have an unbiblical view of work. Some people, some Christians actually believe work is a curse from God. That after the fall in the garden, God said, I'm going to punish you by giving you a job. If only Adam hadn't sinned, we could be, you know, relaxing and eating bonbons for the rest of our existence. But you look at the Bible, God's plan for work began before the fall. God put Adam and Eve in the garden and said, cultivate it and keep it. Some people forget that that was God's plan for us to be workers. Other people say, well, yeah, but my job has some value to the extent that it gives me the opportunity to share the gospel with people. You know, if, if I can witness to a coworker, uh, that makes my job worthwhile. And yet those opportunities are very rare considering how many hours we work. No, the Bible says our work in and of itself has value to God, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But the theme of the message today is God doesn't want us to have regrets about our work. He does want us to find satisfaction in the calling we have, whatever that calling is. Now, before we look at some biblical ways to eliminate regrets about our work, I want to talk about common sources that, of regret that people have. First of all, some people have regrets about their work because of the wrong choice of a career. They're in the wrong job, and that causes dissatisfaction. Many people choose the wrong career because they've been influenced by people they respect in choosing the careers that they had. A well-meaning parent, a well-meaning guidance counselor or teacher may say, I could see you one day doing such and such. And they're well-intentioned, but that person wanting to uh, honor their authority figure chooses a line of work for which they are not well-suited. Now, let's make it very clear. Um, as parents, especially, we're to help our children discover their unique gifts and calling in life. Remember Proverbs 22, verse 6? It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. We've seen before that phrase, in the way he should go, doesn't mean the moral or spiritual direction he should go. That phrase, in the way he should go, means you train your children according to their natural bent, according to their natural interest, because eventually they're going to go that direction. That means if your child enjoys dancing but hates playing the piano, let them give up their piano lessons. Let her go out and take ballet if you want to. If your child is interested in technology and he sits mesmerized in front of the computer, quit insisting that he get on an athletic team that he hates. Give him time. Give him the ability to maximize his technological pursuits. That's what Proverbs 22, 6 is about. Train a child according to his bent. There's a great difference between um, 
helping our children find their right profession and pressuring them in to do so. You know, I'll always be grateful to my parents. They're in heaven now. But uh, the first 15 years of my life, I thought I knew what I was going to do from a very early age. As a child, I just envisioned the way I was going to go. I was going to be involved in the broadcasting business, and I read every journal, every article I could about it until I was 15, and God called me to be a pastor. I mean, I did a 180 in what I thought I was going to be doing, and I'll never forget telling my dad first and my mom that God was calling me to be a pastor. I had no idea what they would think about that, but they both said the same thing individually. They said, we always knew this was God's plan for your life, but we never said anything to you about it because we wanted to make sure it was the Holy Spirit calling you and not us. So there's a balance there between helping our children find their gifts and forcing them into a profession. Many people are dissatisfied because they chose the wrong profession. A second source of regret is a lack of perceived success. They regret the fact that they're not very successful at their work. Now, sometimes that's because they have a wrong standard of success, but many times it can be because they're not gifted for what they think they were supposed to be doing. A third source of regret is excessive time spent at work. Now, I'm going to say this several times. Some people think they're spending too much time at work when, in fact, they're spending too little time at work. I mean, you can be unbalanced in both ways. You can be unbalanced when you spend too much time at your job, but you can also be unbalanced if you're not spending enough time. But some people have made their work an idol and they're spending too much time. Consider this little poem. As Christmases come and go, leaving footprints of time in the snow, I despair for the years spent without joy or tears with my children I'll now never know. Isn't that a depressing <laughs> poem? It was written by a, name, by a man named Robin Koskinen. He was driving home late one December night, filled with regrets. He had just accepted a job with a major securities firm in Massachusetts. And his new job required him to leave the house at 5.45 every morning, not get home to 10.30 at night after his two little girls were asleep. And he was filled with regrets. And he decided after writing that poem to make a major change in his life. He shocked his firm by announcing that he was quitting. What was his motivation in doing that? He said, quote, I sort of felt like if I was struck by a bus and my tombstone read, he did bonds good. What does that bring to the table at the end of the day? Now, since that time, he's found other employment and a job that doesn't require those uh, excessive hours. But he was filled with regret because of too many hours spent at his job. A fourth source of regret, and this may surprise you, but surveys show it, a fourth source of regret people have about their jobs is a failure to take risks in their job. You know, they failed to take that exam that would have qualified them for a higher position, or they failed to make that cold sales call on a prospective buyer, or they uh, failed to start their own business as they dreamed of doing so. They were regretful over risk they were unwilling to take. By the way, did you know the Bible teaches we need to be willing to take some risk? Not reckless risk, but measured risk. You say, where do you find that in the Bible? Glad you ask. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 1. Remember Solomon's counsel? Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Remember in our study of Ecclesiastes, we saw what that verse means. He's not talking about standing at the shore of a lake and picking bread apart and throwing it out there on the water. And no, the phrase, casting your bread on the waters, was a way of saying in Solomon's day, a king who would want to gain new treasure would send many ships out onto the waters. They would be empty. They would travel to different countries. Some of the ships would come back empty. They didn't find any treasure, but... 
some would find great treasure and would be filled. And by the way, that's where we get that phrase, waiting for your ship to come in. People would send their ships out in hopes of treasure. The king didn't regret those that came back empty. He knew that was par for the course, but he rejoiced over the ones that came back filled. In the same way, we're not sure which of our risks will yield great rewards, but we need to be willing to take a risk. Ralph Keyes is an author who's interviewed thousands of people about the subject of risk. He said, most people think the way to minimize regrets about your work is to take few risks, but the opposite is true. He interviewed thousands of people and found that the people who had the fewest regrets about their work were the ones who took the greatest risk rather than the ones who took no risk. The first group could say, even if they failed, well, at least I tried. But those who never took a risk always wondered what might have been. Is it possible to eliminate all the regrets about your work? I don't want to overpromise in this sermon. You're never going to be regret-free completely in your work. Somebody has said there's only one worker in America who has all of his problems behind him, and that's the school bus driver. Uh, I know, it's corny, but it's true. I mean, because we live in a sinful world, because we're sinful people, we're always going to have problems. But I believe there are some things we can do to minimize regrets about this important area of our life, an area God cares about very much. How do you minimize regrets about your work? Number one, and star this three times on your outline, discover your life work. Discover your life work. I was first introduced to this concept of life work by my friend Bob Beal many years ago. And Bob says, the single most important ingredient for satisfaction in your life is discovering your life work. Here's the definition of your life work. It's that work which is the best use of the rest of your life. That work, which is the best use of the work of the rest of your life. You know, when people are in their 20s, they're not ready to discover most of them their life work. In your 20s, it's all about survival. You're just trying to make it. You entered the work world, you're just trying to make it. In your 30s, you go from survival to being concerned about success, climbing the ladder, being the best in your profession. But somewhere in your 40s or 50s, you move beyond survival or even success, and you care about significance, doing something that really matters and is satisfying to you. That is your life work. How can you discover your life work or help your children discover their life work? Let me mention several things that are important. First of all, your life work should utilize both your gifts and your interest. If God is calling you to a certain work, he's going to give you both the gifts and the interest to do that. You say, well, where is that in the Bible? Very clearly, Philippians 2, verse 13. Remember what Paul said? This is the Phillips paraphrase. For it is God who is at work within you, giving you the will and the power to achieve his purpose. If God is calling you to do something, listen to this, he's going to give you the will, the passion to want you to do it. And he's also going to give you the power, the gifts to do that thing he's called you to do. God is not going to call you to do something for which you have no passion or no giftedness. When I was a little boy, my grandfather, who had such an influence on my life, he decided that I needed to be a doctor. And he used to tell me, Robert, if you'll be a doctor, I'll send you to the finest medical school in the country. Now, there are only two problems with that. First of all, somewhere along the way, I had a science bypass operation, and I had absolutely no interest in biology whatsoever. 
when everybody was supposed to in high school be looking in their microscope and seeing an amoeba or something. I mean, I was dazing out the window thinking about something else. I had no interest in science whatsoever. And secondly, I had no gifts. I didn't have the gifts to be a doctor. I mean, can you imagine me with my hyperkinetic personality standing still long enough to do a delicate operation I'd be in court being sued in a flash. I mean, that's just not my giftedness. I have no passion. I have no gift. If God's calling you to do something, he'll give you both things. Here's a question, two questions really, to ask yourself to determine your passion and your gifts. For your passion, ask yourself the question, what needs in the world do I see that I feel passionate about? Your calling from God is going to meet a need. God calls us to do something, not to fill our greed, but to meet somebody else's need. And a calling in life, I'm not just talking about the calling to be a pastor or an evangelist. Any calling is the result of a passion that somebody feels. I think about a pastor I know who was distraught over the fact that he would take his non-Christian friends to church and it'd be so poorly done and, and so uninteresting that the friends would never come back again. He wanted to create a ministry that would be sensitive to the needs of unbelievers, and he started a great church. I think about a woman whose daughter was killed by a drunk driver, Candace Leitner, and as a result of that passion to eliminate the menace of drunk driving in a country she started mad, mothers against drunk drivers. Uh, most of what we do, if it's a true calling to God, is going to come from a need that we feel passionately enough. The second question for your giftedness is, what is my single greatest gift? If you were to say in one word, what's the single greatest power, gift God's given you? For some people, it would be organization, the ability to organize things. Some people, it would be leadership. Some people, it would be communication. But determine what your single greatest strength is or your gift is. The intersection of your passion and your giftedness is going to be your life work. Secondly, your life work should be something you love doing. If you're really performing your life work, it's something you're going to love doing. That doesn't mean you love every part of your job. I mean, teachers may not like faculty meetings. Uh, a salesman may not enjoy filling out the monthly sales report. A pastor may not enjoy going to the hospital. But none of those things represents the core function of his job. However, if you have a teacher who says, I love teaching, I just can't stand the students. <laughs> you know, if you have a pastor saying, I love every part of being a pastor, but I can't stand preaching. Or you have a doctor who faints at the sight of blood, they probably haven't found their life calling. You're going to love the major aspect of your job if you're really called to do it. Thirdly, your life work should provide you with an adequate income. It ought to provide you with an adequate income. There's a difference between a life work and a hobby. A hobby is something you're interested in. You find pleasure in doing, but you couldn't earn a living from it. As many of you know, uh, I grew up playing the accordion. It was a hobby. And uh, I made all of my money in high school and college by playing the accordion at bar mitzvahs and weddings and funerals and anything else I could find. But I would hate trying to make a living doing that. I mean, the interest in polka music isn't what it used to be. Uh, it'd be very hard to, for me to eke out an income uh, by playing the accordion. There's a difference between a hobby and a life work. You say, well, how do you know God cares about how much income we make and that we have an income that's suitable uh, for ourselves and our families. Listen to 1 Timothy 5.8. Paul says, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. God's will, God's command, 
is that we make enough money that we adequately provide for ourselves and our families. And the way he's given us to do that is through our vocation. Fourth, your life work should be confirmed by other people. If you have really discovered your life work, you're going to receive confirmation from other people. They're going to say, man, you make that look so easy. Or man, you just look so fulfilled in what you're doing. There'll be confirmation from others. Likewise, if you're not performing your life work, you'll get little confirmation. <laughs> I'm reminded of that story about the farmer who had this passion. He had the passion to want to preach. He dreamed of preaching in a church one day. And one day he was out working in the field and he looked up in the sky and he saw the clouds supernaturally form two letters in the sky, P, C. And he said, that's it. Preach Christ. That's God speaking to me. So he sold his farm, went to the seminary, got his first church. The only problem was he couldn't preach his way out of a paper bag. And after the particularly bad sermon, one of the deacons came up and said, Pastor, you know that PC you saw in the clouds? Are you sure God wasn't saying plant corn? <laughs> now, we can't be discouraged by one person who may not think we're in our life work. But if you fail to get affirmation from a variety of people, you may not be in your life work. Proverbs 11:14 says, where there is no guidance, the people fail. But in the abundance of counselors, there is victory. People can be a source of guidance about what our life work should be and what it shouldn't be. So, number one, to minimize regrets about your work, most important thing you can do is discover your life work. Number two, refuse to be stuck in your profession. There are some of you listening right now who have already decided you're not in your life work, and you may be open to God leading you to do something different. Now, if that's the leading of God, you're going to be filled with all kinds of emotions about quitting your job or going into a new field. You know, didn't I hear God correctly years ago when I thought he was leading me to do this? And have I wasted all of these years and I've been doing the wrong thing? Let me remind you of a couple of things that will help you in making that transition if God's leading you to make that transition. First of all, realize that your present job and past jobs have value. Don't look at the things you've done in the past as a waste of time. Every job, unless it's immoral or illegal, has value before God. And uh, all of our work is valuable. For example, what is God's will in the world? What is it God wants to do more than anything else? Our whole October 1st day is built around the idea that God wants to save the lost and introduce people into a saving relationship with Christ. That's God's primary purpose, but it's not his only purpose. God has other things he's interested in doing besides saving the lost. For example, how many of you would agree that God wants to take care of the needs of his children? How many would say, that's in Scripture. God wants to take care of our needs. What needs do we have? Well, we have the need to eat. I mean, food's important. Man shall not live by bread alone, but man shall not live without bread either. <laughs> I mean, we need food and so forth. Now, if it's God's will to meet our need, say our need for food, how does he go about doing that? Well, there has to be a Former, a farmer out there PCing, planting corn. But that's not enough. It can't remain on the stalk. Somehow that corn has to get to the grocery store. So there need to be truckers who move the food. And there needs to be people in the oil and gas industry who provide the fuel for the trucker. And the truck needs to go someplace. There needs to be a supermarket that somebody has built. There needs to be somebody 
a cashier, or at least somebody to build those little self-checkout machines. All of those things are important for us to be able to have food to eat for God to provide. What I'm saying to you is God's purpose is much bigger than evangelism. God's purpose is certainly evangelism, but it encompasses more than that. And all of those people, farmers, truckers, supermarket clerks, are all part of God's will. And it's important that they find their calling in life. You know, somebody once said, it's not what we do that determines whether our work is sacred or secular, it's why we do it. So, don't understand that your job has value. Secondly, see your job as a stepping stone instead of a plateau. One way to lessen the guilt about changing professions is to realize that your job is a stepping stone and not a plateau. Have you ever been in a job interview before where somebody has said the person interviewing you saying, no, we don't want you to view this job as a stepping stone to something else. And we understand what they mean. You don't want to hire somebody who's always thinking about the next job instead of their current job. But the truth is, everything we do is a stepping stone to something else. As Christians, we believe that history is linear and that our history and the history of the world is moving every day closer to the return of Jesus Christ and the recreation of the new heaven and new earth. So, our jobs, whatever they are, are a stepping stone perhaps to another job, or it may be a stepping stone to retirement, to death, and to the return of Jesus Christ. So understand that all jobs are stepping stones to something else. Think about the Apostle Paul. Think about all the career changes he went through. He was a Pharisee first, and then he was saved, and he became an evangelist, a missionary, a church planter, an author, until God called him home. Understand our jobs are leading us somewhere. Number three, understand the importance of diligence. Now, this is key. Understand the importance of diligence. The only thing worse than coming to the end of your work career with regrets about choosing the wrong career is coming to the end of your career with the realization that you could have been more successful if you had exerted the effort needed. You know, if only I had read more in my field, if only I had networked more, if only if I had not slacked up, slacked off so much, I wouldn't have these regrets about my lack of success. In his book, Ordering Your Private World, Gordon MacDonald describes the tragic life of poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge as an example of somebody who failed to understand the importance of diligence in his job, Gordon writes, Coleridge is the supreme tragedy of indiscipline. Never did so great of a mind produce so little. He left Cambridge University to join the army. He left the army because he couldn't rub down a horse. He returned to Oxford and left without a degree. He began a paper called The Watchman, which lived for 10 issues and then died. It has been said of Coleridge, he lost himself to visions of work to be done that always remained to be done. Coleridge had every poetic gift but one, the gift of sustained and concentrated effort. Timmons Wilson, the founder of Holiday Inns, once gave the secret of success. He said, you know how to be successful in life? Just work half a day. Just work half a day. Doesn't matter which half, it can be the first 12 hours of the day or the last 12 hours, <laughs> but you'll be successful in what you do. Kim and Williams was really just echoing the words of King Solomon. King Solomon talks about the value of diligence in what we do. In Proverbs 10 verse four, Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Or Proverbs 12, 24, the hand of the diligent will rule, but the slack hand will be put to forced labor. Proverbs 13, 4, the soul of the sluggard craves and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made fat. 
And maybe you would say, I have no interest in being rich, powerful, or fat. But don't miss what Solomon is saying. Those who fail to work hard at what God has called them to do will become victims of poverty, servitude, and discontent. You know what the antidote to slothfulness, laziness is in our work? It's found in the passage I had you read a few moments ago. Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, notice the whatever. Doesn't matter if you're a farmer, supermarket, clerk, trucker, whatever you do, do your work diligently, enthusiastically unto the Lord, remembering it is the Lord your God whom you serve. Finally, how do you minimize regrets about your work? Don't overestimate the importance of work. Yes, our job is an important part of our life. It makes up the majority of how we spend our waking hours. But don't overestimate the value of your job either. Let me illustrate that for you. Before my granddad died, he gave to us a beautiful Remington bronze sculpture. Man, it was heavy. And there was a pedestal that went with it. So we had that statue up on the pedestal. And then as our girls got older, we realized they could easily topple that pedestal and that bronze would come crashing down and kill them or destroy the furniture. So we voluntarily took that sculpture off the pedestal and put it lower, where if it fell, it wouldn't do any damage. You know, that's a great analogy of how we ought to look at our work. If we elevate our work too much, too high, then when it comes crashing down because of sickness, termination, or just retirement, the damage can be substantial. Work is important, but keep it in balance with every other aspect of your life. Let me ask you three questions in closing. Have you found your life work, that work which is the best use of the rest of your life? Question number two, at the end of most days, not every day, but most days, are you able to say, I gave my job my very best efforts? And third, is your work in balance with every other area of your life? To be in balance may not mean it's overinflated. It may be underinflated like a tire. But are you spending the right effort on your work and is it in balance with the rest of your life? Your ability to say yes to those three questions will determine your ability to work without regret. Let's bow together in prayer. Our work matters, matters to God. But there's one thing, as valuable as work is, there's one thing God refuses to allow us to work for, and that's our salvation. Romans 4, 5 says, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. The greatest need any of us has today is the need for the forgiveness of our sins because we are moving closer to closer to that day when we meet God. It's appointed unto every one of us once to die and then the judgment, the Bible says. The only way we can know we've been forgiven of our sins when we meet God is not to work, but to receive God's gift of forgiveness. I don't think it's an accident you're here today, that you're in day one or you've tuned into iCampus. God is offering you the gift of forgiveness if you're willing to receive it today. And today, if you would like to receive that gift, I invite you to pray this prayer in your heart as I prayed out loud, knowing that God is listening to you. Would you pray this with me? Dear God, thank you for loving me. I know that I have failed you in so many ways, <clears throat> and I'm truly sorry for the sins in my life. But I believe what I've heard today, that you loved me so much, you sent your son Jesus 
to die on the cross for me, to take the punishment I deserve to take for my sins. And right now, I'm trusting in what Jesus did for me, not in my good works, but in what Jesus did for me to save me from my sins. Thank you for forgiving me and help me to live the rest of my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. For the multitude of you watching on iCampus, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, go to the top of the screen, click on the link that says, I prayed the prayer with Pastor Jeffress. As soon as you do that, we'll be notified of your decision. I have some free material I want to send you this week about what it means to live your life as a Christian. Now, for those of you in day one or here in our worship center, I'd invite you to take out the card that's in your bulletin. And if you prayed that prayer, we want to know about it. Just check the second box, I prayed the prayer to trust in Christ today. If you do that, we'll send you the same material we're sending our online friends. Maybe like so many last week, you'd like to join First Baptist Dallas. It's never been easier. All you have to do is check that third box. We'll call you this week and process your membership information. If you're a guest today, we certainly want to know that. When you have finished the card, just drop it off at the Welcome Center on the way out, and we'll give you a copy of my book, What Every Christian Should Know, along with the CD of our marvelous choir and orchestra. Thank you so much for doing that. This coming Saturday night, beginning at 6.30 Central, 7.30 Eastern, TBN begins airing my 11-part series, 18 Minutes with Jesus, that we filmed in Israel earlier this year. It's a sermon built around, the series is built around Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. As I said, it was filmed in Israel, and they have done a great job with this series. So I encourage you and uh, anybody you know, encourage them to tune in this coming Saturday and every Saturday for the next 11 weeks for the series 18 Minutes with Jesus. Now, to introduce that uh, series, this Tuesday night, September 19th, I'll be a uh, guest on the special edition of the program Praise with Matt and Laurie Crouch that we filmed on the shores of the Lake of Gal Sea of Galilee. And uh, we invite you to tune in at 7 o'clock this coming Tuesday night on TBN for a special edition of Praise. Thank you so much for being here today. If you haven't gone to Sunday school yet, you'll want to be sure and do that. We started Discipleship University last Sunday night with a record crowd of over 1,200. We invite you to come and join us for DU tonight at 5.30. Don't forget to be praying for and inviting your one person for uh, October 1st. Now, you can invite more than one person, but be sure you've got somebody you're concentrating on to invite. Thank you for doing that. Well, it's been a great day to be in God's house. Let's stand together as Tyler comes to lead us in our final song. Thank you, Pastor. A wonderful morning of worship, church. Let's go out singing praise to our Lord and Savior. This is my story. This is my song. Hello, I'm Emmanuel Pendula, but you can call me Manny, your iCampus pastor. Thanks for joining us for worship. I hope you feel uplifted and encouraged after today's service. Continue to spread the joy by inviting your loved ones to join us every week and stay connected on our social media platforms and iCampus Global Facebook group, where you'll find inspiring content, updates, and connect with believers worldwide. 
Also, join our iCampus community for a Sunday school lesson taught by Ryland Whitehorn, our executive pastor of ministries at 8.30, 9.15, and 11 a.m. Central Time. I look forward to personally getting to know you. So be sure to leave a message in the chat about how I can pray and minister to you. Remember, we're here to serve you every Sunday morning and throughout the week in your spiritual walk. Stay blessed and see you soon. Many people suffer unending regrets because they've chosen to say no to God's most basic commands. That's why I wrote my new book, The Ten, How to Live and Love in a World That's Lost Its Way. And in my new book, The Ten, I share what the Ten Commandments mean and how they apply to our lives, and most importantly, why they are God's proven method for freeing us to experience blessings we could never imagine. Discover God's time-tested blueprint for a joyful and flourishing life. The new book is called The Ten. Pick up a copy today wherever books are sold.